Welcome back to the Bitcoin Layer. I'm Nick Batia. Today, we welcome Justin Wales. Justin is the head of legal for crypto.com in the Americas, and he is the author of a brand new book called The Crypto Legal Handbook. Justin, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Nick. Justin, we have huge news out of Washington, D.C. this week. The House votes down the SEC's anti crypto agenda. This is a big deal for a couple reasons. Number one, that we see Congress coming out against the SEC, but number two, that there's a bipartisan spin to this latest news. So break it down for us. What happened in Congress this week and what's the takeaway? Sure. Um, so to give everyone a, a bit of background, so um, uh, previously the SEC had put out what they call an accounting bulletin, which basically said that for any SEC reporting company, so this includes public banks, this includes anyone who has to file financial records with the, um, the SEC, if they were holding any type of crypto under custody, then they would have to um, m mark the crypto as a liability on their own balance sheet. So what that means is if I am holding uh, $100 of Bitcoin on your behalf, Nick, under SEC uh, uh, Accounting Bulletin 121, I would have to put that as $100 of my own liability. And what that means is that when, uh, if I'm a bank, I have additional capital requirements. It costs a lot more for me to custody um, crypto on behalf of others. So this was um, you know, very controversial at the time. It, you know, a number of the Republicans in Congress said that this was an anti-crypto um, move intended to um, restrict or to make it much more difficult for um, public financial companies to hold crypto on behalf of uh, customers. Um, several months ago, the Government Accountability Office said that this w was not appropriate as an accounting bulletin, and this should have been gone through rulemaking. But regardless, you know, the, the bill, uh, the the bulletin remained in place. What happened yesterday was that there was a uh, vote on the floor to um, essentially reject the accounting bulletin. And what was interesting about it is that um, 21 Democrats joined the Republicans in order to uh, approve uh, basically the revocation of this accounting bulletin. Um, just prior to the vote, President Biden said that if this will get to his desk, he'll veto it. So it's unlikely that this manifests into you know, law. Um, but regardless, it, it still now has to go to the Senate. Um, Senator Lummis said that she has, I think, 30 Republicans right now that are willing to take this vote up. So. Um, you know, unclear whether this will pass in the Senate with bipartisan support as well. But to the extent that it does and it gets to the president's desk, the president said um, he would he would veto it. I, I sort of doubt if it ever gets to his desk in the first place. But this is very clearly a victory um, for uh, the crypto community in that it demonstrates that there are some bipartisan support um, for uh, at least some aspects of a uh, pro crypto agenda. The Bitcoin layer is very proud to be sponsored by River, a Bitcoin only exchange and who we believe to be the leader in the business. Go check them out today at river.com slash TBL for a special offer of up to $100 of Bitcoin for free. When you go sign up, you have a lot of options when it comes to buying Bitcoin. We believe River is your best choice because they do not custody your Bitcoin on a third party exchange. They have their own solution for storage and they encourage you to get your coins off the exchange as soon as possible. River.com slash TBL for that special offer. Now the election is starting to come into focus and whether we like it or not, politics are now part of the conversation for the Bitcoin community. And I know Justin that you at crypto.com you can't speak to any of the legal matters on the exchanges front, but with that being taken out of the equation for a second, let's talk about the election. Is there a clear, or let's just say, is the Republican party the clear pro crypto party? And is the democratic party coming out as a very anti crypto party or is it more mixed? 
And what are some, besides the White House, what are some of the other issues or candidates on the ballot in November that have your attention? Yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting at like a presidential level, I think the lines are, are, are fairly clear. Um, but when you get a little lower in, in terms of uh, Congress, senators, sometimes even especially local politicians, you do find that there's quite a bit of bipartisan support. And uh, in a lot of cases, this is um, generational rather than politically um, entirely partisan d- divided. I saw a, um, uh, a a tweet, I haven't confirmed it, but I saw a tweet about the 21 Democrats who voted um, with the Republicans yesterday. And it said that the average age of those 21, I guess someone did the calculations, uh, was about 48 years old. Now, that uh, is older than us, but in terms of Congress, those are those are our babies, right? So it, it, it's it's clear to me that at least in terms of um, a generational divide, it's it's much more of a bipartisan issue. I think there are also some examples of um, political action committees and um, like think tanks who have done some polling, and they find that the, you know younger members of Congress, regardless of their uh, political ideology, are more supportive of the industry, and I think accept that the idea of um, digital assets, the idea of of a more digital financial system is sort of an inevitability. Um, so I, I, I do think that we're starting to get um, more vocal democratic supporters. And I think that's, that's a good thing. And, and I just think this is going to continue and continue. Justin, you are a longtime Bitcoiner. Why did you decide to write a book on the legal side of the industry? Yeah, I mean, there are a couple of reasons. The the first is, I think, um, for folks who are coming out of college, coming out of law school, and they're interested in in crypto, they're interested in Bitcoin, they're interested in you know the the where technology is going. It's really intimidating to try to get first principles to understand. Okay, where do I go if I've never heard of Bitcoin, let alone everything else in the industry? Where do I go to get my first you know foray into that? Well, I can point to, okay, here's a couple Andre Antonopoulos videos you can get, right, for, right? Here you can read uh, um, Layered Money to get some of the background on on the economics of it. But at some point, you're just kind of like picking hundreds and hundreds of sources and videos. And that's what I would do is I would provide people who would ask me, like, where do I start? Um, You know, a list of about 100 podcasts and YouTube videos and, and, and things like that. And it was unhelpful. No one wanted to, like, sift through it. So I started writing this book as a way of saying, okay, here's the first place to start. And the book is, you know, it's called the Crypto Legal Handbook, but it's it's written for lawyers and non-lawyers, right? Non-lawyers who want to understand, well, how did we get to the point where we have votes on staff accounting bulletins? Well, what is a staff accounting bulletin? Lots of people who are who are interacting with the news from yesterday probably don't understand what a staff accounting bulletin is. They probably don't understand what the SEC really is and what their mandate is. They don't understand how that compares to the CFTC. They don't understand how like the different um, areas of government work together for like financial regulations. So the idea behind this book was to give someone who had no idea what Bitcoin is, no idea what crypto is, no idea what the government really is, a first place to start. And if you read the 250 pages that I put together, by the end of it, you you should have a good sense of where we are um, as of like right now in the industry. Well, it sounds like it would be helpful in a time like now where we have so much regulatory uncertainty. And so what is the current state of regulation toward Bitcoin and the crypto industry at large today in the United States? You know, it's it's interesting because in a lot of in a lot in many senses a lot of it is clear, right? Because we're regulated at a state level primarily. And the states have been pretty proactive in giving guidance Um, in terms of like uh, compliance issues, Department of Treasury, right? These are like FinCEN, OFAC, which are sanctions issues. A lot of that is clear, but there are these little pockets where there's still uncertainty. A good example of this is the Samurai case from um, a couple of weeks ago, the indictment or the tornado cash, right? The interplay between what is your liability if you are creating a, a program? that allows folks to interact directly with each other in a manner which had 
the interaction been done through a central entity would be regulated. What is your liability for just being the creator of that of, of that program? That's something that we're still um, kind of wrestling with. Certainly there's this idea of like, where is the line between a security or a, a non-security commodity, which is sort of also in, in play. And then beyond that, there's a broader question of how do we as the United States want to treat um, virtual asset service providers, right? VASPs, VASPs. Do we want to have a very strict market structure um, regime? Do we want to continue to leave it up to different states? Do we want to continue to leave it up to securities versus non-securities? These are questions for, for Congress. And, you know, I think yesterday was the very first bill that was specifically crypto related to pass the House. So, you know, at some point, the House is going to have to take up a broader agenda. And as you can imagine, that's going to be very difficult. There are a number of open issues, but a, a lot of it is um, fairly settled, especially with respect to like Bitcoin. Bitcoin has sort of been granted a special status under the law in, in a lot of cases. So just the um, buying and selling of, of, of Bitcoin is pretty, um, pretty uh you know, settled at, at, at this point, but there's broader questions regarding um, Lightning Network nodes, unhosted wallets that we're still trying to work out. How do you view the separation of Bitcoin, and the kind of classification of it as something that is now more on the approved side of things? How does that compare to things historically, legally? What, are, what are other precedents are there out there for Bitcoin? Yeah, you know, one of the things that I do in, in, in this book is I try to take people through the history of crypto, uh, the, the, the development of Bitcoin, um, the splintering of Bitcoin to Ethereum, the splintering of Ethereum to sort of the, the broader, you know, DeFi uh, space, and also um, overlay that with the history of regulations. And I think there's like a pretty good argument to be made that the reason why Bitcoin has enjoyed this special status is just the amount of time it's been in the market and the anonymity of its founder. And you would, uh, you know, imagine if, if Satoshi today created Bitcoin and he had, you know, we knew who he was, it, it would probably be pretty likely that he would be under some sort of investigation, right? So that that's not an ideal situation for uh, a, a government, you know, to, to, to put onto an industry, which is to say, Everyone is in a special stat is is in a, is in one uh, category except for this one anonymous project. So, what we're seeing kind of happening in in a lot of the um, you know discussions about where is the line between a security or a non security is well, what is fundamentally different between Bitcoin and 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 everything else? And there are are arguments. Okay, there's proof of work versus maybe proof of stake and 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 sort of. Uh, other arguments regarding the size of the network, the idea that it's decentralized, but it's very hard to come up with like a a a, a strict line principle about why Bitcoin should be treated, um, you know, differently than than, than everything else. And I, I think that's why I, um, it's it's important for folks, even on the entire entirety on on the Bitcoin side of the industry, to understand well what's really happening with the broader legal questions being developed because it's. It's only a very small line between, oh, well, that's that's only happening to Ripple. It couldn't happen to us. That's only happening to Ripple and Ethereum. It couldn't happen to us. To, well, okay, well, what is the, the actual principle there? If it's not a strong principle, then everyone should be concerned that we're not coming up with a, um, you know, a, a, a regime that can actually be uh, applied neutrally. Now, what are some of the pro-Bitcoin states that we need to focus on going forward as as bitcoiners thinking about pro mining and then pro virtual asset service provider yeah you know i i, I would say that there are relatively few if if no states that i would classify as anti bitcoin at this point i think like most state agencies or like, you know, these are money service uh, regulators, money transmitter regulators are um, 
pretty neutral to just accepting that this is part of the you know digital payments platform and they've s- set up rules there are always some um like local jurisdictions that are wrestling with the idea of um a bitcoin mining ban right so the idea that okay there's too much energy being used but i i haven't really seen any take um uh get so so uh, far along that it's become like an actual an actual threat there's a couple years ago i think several years ago there was some um thought about a bitcoin mining ban in in new york for instance but i i i don't believe that that um moratorium um really impacted the the local industry although i i'm not a, a you know focused on mining so i i haven't been following what what has happened there now what about the etfs that have come on the scene do you see uh, a knock on effect with any other legislation or regulatory moves that are looking at that example and saying okay now this is in the past therefore we can go forward with xyz are you seeing any of that uh not directly but i think the etfs have had a legitimizing effect on the industry as as a whole especially in 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 some circles you know the idea that you have some of the largest asset managers in in the world wanting to put their money in bitcoin with you know uh, somewhat direct exposure uh, i i think de-risks the idea of digital assets um as custodians become um uh you know better recognized by uh state regulators i think that also de-risks and that's one of the reasons why to bring it back to the SAB 121 you know the 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 real impact of the accounting bulletin is it makes it really difficult for large banks to hold custody on your your behalf it just becomes economically sort of un, unfeasible in, in in a lot of circumstances well you can imagine that if you're just an average person who is uncomfortable with self custody how do you want your your crypto to to be held well maybe they would want it to be held by you know bank of america or jp morgan but right now that's that's unfeasible so um i think as you get um entrenched traditional financial companies to be more involved in the digital asset space whether it's bitcoin or 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 something else i think the knock on effect is that regulators become more willing to accept that this is um these types of businesses have a place in in the future and they become more willing to work and to think sort of outside the box on how do we make sure that current regulations um can be applied to these new types of business models um in a way that doesn't undermine the purpose of the the business in the first place and i know you wrote your book the crypto legal handbook so that people can understand this industry better and so that lawyers can understand and fight on behalf of the industry my question to you is do you feel that the future is bright for this industry in the united states given our legislative body bodies and regulatory framework and what and obviously you're working for one of the largest exchanges in the world on the legal side you have a front seat watching all of this unfold you must be approaching it with some optimism i'm hoping but i'm curious and if you could tell the audience how you see the future of bitcoin in america yeah i mean i think it's very bright i think any of uh, any of the issues that we are having are i would say um short term political issues and in in you know i i don't think anyone is really concerned that 5 years from now 10 years from now there isn't a robust digital asset um industry um we're having some some growing pains because we're trying to apply um you know old regulations and old old principles to new technologies and this is always the case as as uh, you know we innovate but i think overall it's 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 very bright i will say like one of the reasons i wrote this book is because i think it's important um that lawyers have an understanding for the technologies and the industries that they are advocating on behalf of. So one of the things that I I saw in my own career when I when I started practicing I was um 
uh, represent crypto companies. I was a second year lawyer. I, I didn't, I didn't know anything. I would have to go to sort of like the old guys in the room and say, Oh, well, you know, you're, you're a payments lawyer. My friends have a company. Let me sit in the middle and kind of like translate between the two, the two ends. And what I found is like a reluctance by the entrenched legal professionals to learn anything about the industry itself. And you'd be surprised how many lawyers representing companies in the space continue to just think, well, the idea that I'm going to learn anything technical is below me. And I'm not advocating in this book that a lawyer needs to have a computer science degree or that they need to be, you know, able to code or, or anything like that. But I do think that a lawyer representing any part of this industry needs to take itself seriously and needs to, needs to take the industry seriously. So one of the things I try to do is give um, even non-technical folks the skills that they would need to like understand what are the first principles of Bitcoin? How, how does this work? Why does this work? And why is it necessary beyond just, okay, it's an asset, but like getting involved in some of the philosophy behind self-custody and then expanding that outward to non-Bitcoin projects. Because I do think it's important if you're having a, a lawyer or, uh, you know, or, um, a politician or a anyone who's advocating on behalf of the industry, be able to like answer non-obvious questions about why is this important? How does this work? And you can see a lot of examples within space of lawyers who just don't care to care to learn. A lot of times that th this also happens is someone gets really involved in Bitcoin. They learn everything they can about Bitcoin. They read all the Bitcoin books. They listen to the podcast. And then they sort of just say, okay, I don't need to learn anything else about what's happened since you know, 2016. They kind of shut their brain off and they say, well, I'm a Bitcoiner. That's all I need to focus on. That might work for your investment portfolio. That might work for you know areas of the industry, but it doesn't really work if you're on the regulatory and the policy side, because there has been a lot of, of movement and that movement does come up in a lot of the conversations. Now, the good thing about it is it used to be that there were only these like young kids at um, these law firms who knew anything about crypto and they would try to like translate for the older guys. Bitcoin has been around for so long now that in a lot of cases, those young kids now have some level of seniority and you are actually seeing some very good lawyers in private practice and cer certainly in within in-house um, positions that really have an elite level understanding of the industry. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're um, starting to get into a better place uh, generally is that because the folks who were pretty junior have aged into a position and then they've been able to train folks beneath them. And one of the points of, of this book is I thought to myself, if someone was coming to me and they didn't know anything and they wanted my job, what would be the lesson plan? And I kind of wrote this as, okay, these are 18 chapters, 18 um, different sort of lessons that I would want to give to get someone trained, you know, not probably not to my level, but with the skills they need to then go and, and do some self-studying on their own to, to learn more about it. And then the book sort of ends with an idea, well, how do you keep up with this industry? The way I think you do it, right, is you've got to know who to follow on Twitter. you got to know sort of what podcasts to, to, to follow. You have to know sort of where the news is breaking and where discussions are happening. Um, and I give kind of a list of like where I think like a fo someone should should go. And then beyond that, it's just keeping up and trying to find a passion. Because if you are actually disinterested in like the reason why we have crypto in the first place or had Bitcoin in the first place, then you're just not going to have it in you to keep up with how fast everything moves. Justin Wales, author of a new book. Please tell people where they can buy your book. And I want the audience to know. Uh, Justin and I are friends and I, I can tell you personally, he's been working on this book for at least three years and it's a lot of work that goes into something like this. And I know that you'll, you'll need to update it as we go because you know, times are changing. So yeah, please tell people where they can find it. Yeah. If you go to the crypto legal handbook.com, you can find links to, uh, you know, paperback copies through Amazon or a digital copy through the website. If you type in, um, uh, code layered, then um, you'll get 10% uh, off the digital copy. So, uh, you know, uh, and if, if uh, you want to keep up with all the news of crypto law and policy, I have a newsletter that I started, which is at the crypto legal handbook.com slash newsletter. And every Friday, I'll send you basically a recap of everything that's happened in that week and 
and uh, probably everything you need to know uh, from a law and policy side. Perfect. Justin Wales, thank you so much for joining us at the Bitcoin Layer. I'm Nick Batia. We'll catch you guys next time. Thanks, Nick. The Bitcoin Layer is proud to be sponsored by River. River.com slash TBL for that special offer. And the reason that we love River at the Bitcoin Layer is that they put your education first. River.com slash learn to understand what Bitcoin is, the fundamentals. Also, how to get your Bitcoin off the exchange into your own custody solution. You can use river.com slash learn for all of that information. Go check them out today.